Before I begin, um, I just want to uh, dedicate this shear uh, that this shear should be a blessing and a merit for the health and success of the families of Regina Bas Yosef Ruvain and Yeshaya Ben Yisrael Ben Yaman Wolf Ben Zvihesh and Borach Ben Ben Yaman Wolf. They should all have a schus uh, in this shear. I'd like to talk about something which is obviously not only the forefront of everybody's mind, every Jewish person, uh, but also the entire world, you know, and try to offer uh, what I think, what seems to be happening, you know, based on the divine plan. Now, you know, obviously we don't know why the Rebbeinu does anything, actually. You know, unless it becomes incredibly obvious. <clears throat> but it's still very important to understand the justice of God and uh, what obviously bothers him, so to speak, and therefore what can be his possible motives. And we have to try to learn from that because the Rabbanu Shalom obviously runs the world and not only that, <clears throat> but his will is supreme and uh, that obviously is everlasting and we have to really try to understand you know what the requirements of, of, of the Rabbanu Shalom is you know <clears throat> so as such I want to try to give what I think is uh, going on especially from the standpoint of the divine plan which is very very important uh, I'm sure everybody's walking around wondering what in the world is going on uh, so obviously I'm going to try to deal with that. Now there are many points that I want to bring out. And in some way, you know, I want to show you how they're connected. So obviously there are many more points that can be spoken about, which obviously I'm not going to do because who's got the time for all that? But at least to give you some type of a grasp in terms of what I think is happening and why. <clears throat> Now, I want to tell you something which is very important. Um, there's a Pasuk in Tehillim, in one of the Shia Hamalas, that, that we say from Tehillim of Baidu HaMelech and so on. It's a very important idea, and it's a tremendous illusion that mankind has. And we really see it illustrated during this event, the Arab-Israeli war, the Hamas, Israeli war and so on. You know, what we begin to recognize is the incredible supremacy and domination of God. And in many ways, that's one of the problems of mankind. There's no real fear of God. Either they've done away with God, they don't believe in Him, they're just not afraid of Him, His system of justice, His righteousness, and His ultimate retribution. They're just not afraid. So really, I just want to you know, emphasize that we have no idea of what the retribution will be. But I guarantee you one thing. It's going to be incredibly severe, really severe. And the Rosham sends warnings, which unfortunately goes unheeded by mankind. Uh, so it says a posik in uh, a verse in the, one of the Shia Malos, and I'll translate it into English, that if God, if the Rabbani Shem, does not guard a city, then the watchmen guard it in vain. That's what it says. And then it says that if the Rabbani Shem doesn't build a city, whatever, then the builders build it in vain. Uh, what does that mean? That, that's the revelation of a profound concept that we think we are in charge. You know, we do, we decide what has to be done, and we do it, and we, therefore we want to take all the credit. But we don't realize that everything we do needs the agreement of God, or it doesn't get done. I don't care who you are, how powerful you are, how rich you are, or whatever. If the Rabbana Shalom is not maskim, which means he's not in agreement, it's not part of his divine agenda, 
and that's really what he wants, it doesn't get done. <clears throat> and in two ways. The first way is you are unprotected. You can have an entire army around you. You can have the greatest military intelligence of all time, right? And you will commit the most idiotic failure, right, of intelligence, which we have now seen. Because obviously, which we will understand, the Bershom decided mm, that intelligence must be failed in order to bring this about. So that's the first thing. The second thing which it says in that Pesach is that the Bershom doesn't build anything, it doesn't get done. You know, we want to do things with our lives and so on, with the country and all that, but if it's not part of his agenda, it doesn't get done. It doesn't make any difference how much money you have, you know, and how many skilled workers you have. It is irrelevant. <clears throat> and we see this in many ways demonstrated with this, the current events of the war of the Hamas and, and, uh, and the Jews. It's incredible when you, when you look at this. What the Bashma has done is actually many things, which I want to point out. And in terms of e each of these ideas, uh, you, know, you can have a whole discussion about, because they're very important, very significant, very profound. So, so let's take a look. <clears throat> so the first idea that you have to remember is God is in charge, not you. Not the Arabs, not the Jews. Nobody's in charge. It all depends what the Bersham wants to do based on his agenda, based on his plan. So you have to get that straight. That's number one. <clears throat> Second idea, you know, <clears throat> what is amazing, and I'm going to point out, which I think certain amazing ideas, and I haven't really heard them mentioned uh, by that many people or by anybody, in fact, you know, this happened a day after Hushan Arabo. Is that an accident? Was that a coincidence? We know that Rosh Hashanah is the Day of Judgment. And it's a Day of Judgment for the entire year. And I gave a shir about Rosh Hashanah, which you can look up, and so on. <clears throat> that the essential idea of Rosh Hashanah, it's not so much, or the emphasis isn't on judging a person in terms of, well, did he do mitzvahs? Or did he do sins? No. The judgment that occurs on Rosh Hashanah primarily is to determine the status of Tikkun. Where is the rectification process holding? <clears throat> are we closer or are we further away from the Mashiach? That's what it's all about. So who is the one who contributes, right, to the Mashiach coming? The Jewish people by their acts. Therefore, he evaluates the Jewish people. That's why he does it. You see, because the primary interest of the Bersham is where is the Tikkun status, the status of rectification? How much righteousness have the Jews done? Or on the reverse, unfortunately, how much sinning have they done? And so on. Uh, so Rosh Hashanah occurred, what, 24 days before? It's incredible, the immediacy of what happened. So Rosh Hashanah is a day of judgment, as I said, but it's really a day of evaluation of the Tikkun process. And then Yom Kippur, right? Yom Kippur, of course, is a day of atonement, where what the Rosh Hashanah wants us is to have input into that evaluation. He wants us to influence the verdict, because that's what he issues on Rosh Hashanah. And therefore, he gave us 10 days to do tshuva, or whatever, right? So we can actually have input into the verdict itself. Because he does not want to punish us. He wants to do tremendous good for us. Because in reality, he's our father. And fathers don't take retribution on their kids, right? They discipline their kids. That is the nature of the actions of God against the Jews. So... Rosh Hashanah happens, so there's dinam, judgments, right? Then you have Yom Kippur, and then you have Hoshana Rabbah, which occurred, right, on Friday. And this war started on Shabbos, the day later. And what's the significance of Hoshana Rabbah? We know, Kabbalistically, 
right? So the judgment occurs on, uh, on Rosh Hashanah, right? Then Yom Kippur is an atonement day, but it's not, it's signed, but it's not sealed. There was any decree that God, uh, you know, uh, issues, gets signed, gets issued on Rosh Hashanah. On Yom Kippur it is signed, but the seal does not happen until Hashanah Rabbah. <clears throat> what is so startling is that this happened the next day. That's immediate. That means what that means is that God is not waiting. He's not waiting, and usually many times, even if there's a decree, he waits. <coughs> because again, he wants people to do chuv and so on. What is incredible is that he didn't wait. The next day, after the judgment was sealed, God determined that there has to be this war, and tragically, as part of the Xero, the decree, that the Jews have to go through what is called a horrendous slaughter. And I want to begin to, to explain that. What does this tell us? It means that God is not waiting. He wants to accelerate the process of Mashiach. And he's not going to wait. So it happens immediately after, right? Hoshana Rabbah, which is the day which actually sealed, you see. <clears throat> That's the reason why the Baruch Hashem does this. Because remember one thing, it's very important. Whatever God does, whether it be, you know, a reward, something great, or punishment, whatever it does, must advance the messianic process. Or else it would never happen. That's how exact is the plan of God. So the fact that this happened, this gzero, this terrible gzero against the Jewish people, that's basically what it is, happened, has many multifaceted ideas. It's called multi-deterministic. But you have to remember the main idea behind all of this is in some way it has to advance the purpose of creation, which means God wants to come back, and that is the messianic process. So that is a source of chizuk. As bad as everything is, what's happening now, the slaughter, the butchery, and so on, the inhuman, subhuman activity of Hamas and the other Arabs and so on, right? It must advance the process. The question it's, which is very, you know, instructive for us is, well, how? You see, but at least that's the good news if, they can, if you can even use that expression, good news. <clears throat> you see, it would be terrible if it didn't advance the process, if it all did, was make a lot of people suffer, that would be terrible. But you have to understand, everything that God does must advance the process. So in that sense, it's called the silver lining. Not that we want that, but in the end, it benefits us. As strange as that sounds. In many ways, it's like a guy goes to a surgeon because he has cancer. And the surgeon says, listen, the bad news is he got cancer. The good news is that it can be removed. Even wait a minute, to remove means surgery. Who wants to do that? Who wants to do an invasive, right, uh, procedure on the body? But at least the good news is that you will survive. That's how you have to look that, at this, that even though it's this min HaShemayim, that the Jews will go through terrible suffering, okay, it must advance the process, which means ultimately it will accelerate the Mashiach coming. <coughs> the question is how? Okay, so I just want to, what's called, reframe the idea. You know, do not think that this has no purpose except suffering. No, it must advance the purpose. But the question, of course, we would like to know, what is the purpose of this? So this is what I would like to begin to talk. <clears throat> uh, there's a very interesting medrash. It's in the Yalkut Shemoni, uh, in uh, the Nevi'im, Yeshaya, actually, uh, section uh, 499. It says the following, very interesting. Om Rabbi Yitzchok. Rabbi Yitzchok says the following, and it's an incredible prophecy when you think about it. Remember, this was said 
thousands of years ago, 2,000 years ago, is when this particular medrash was said. He said that in the end of time, the Akhras Hayomim, or he actually says, in the week, which really means in the seven-year period, right, of the end of time, all right, of Mashiach ben Dovid, that end time, Persia will war with Arav, will conduct a war with Arav. Now, Persia, we know who that is. That's Iran. And it says that they, Iran, and I've said this message before, that Iran will conduct a war against Arav. Now, we know who Arav is. Arav is basically Saudi Arabia. So he's saying that Iran will conduct a war against Saudi Arabia and all the Sunnis, you see, because that's really what they're against, see? And then it says that Arav is going to consult with Edom. Now, Edom, we know from many sure, is the United States and the West and so on. Uh, and it says that they will begin to destroy the world, <coughs> Iran. Now, you know, we can ask ourselves, what? Iran doesn't have that power. And the answer is, of course they do. What do you think has been going on for the last 30 years? They're going nuclear. And they're what? People estimate they're only two weeks away from having a bomb. So they're no longer, you know, a mild threat. They are an existential threat. You know, and make no mistake, Iran wants to take over the world. That's the concept of jihad, to, play, to place Sharia law throughout the entire world and subjugate all mankind to Islam and so on. So they will conduct a war and America will get involved. But then it says that obviously the major war is against Israel. So it says that Israel will be tremendously frightened. Baha'u'llah. You see, and that is a very interesting statement because we say to ourselves, why are they so frightened? I mean, Israel's probably got at least 100 nuclear weapons. So what does it mean they will be frightened? Well, as you will see, what it means is that that war, now it doesn't necessarily mean Iran, but certainly a proxy of Iran is who? Is Hamas. So it means Hamas, a proxy of Iran. And the Bahola, which is the fear that Israel has, is the incredible brutality of what they have done to Jews. I mean, you listen to some of the broadcasts, it's, it's hard to believe. You, you talk about subhumans. It's not, this, the, this is not humanity. These are animals, beasts, and so on. And even a beast doesn't do this. Right? They don't mutilate people, behead 40 infants, rape women, burn them. I mean, this is just absolutely incredible. Because what they want to do is not just win in that sense, but they want to instill terror and fear and enormous pain to the Jewish people. That's the Baha'u'llah, you see. Because the reaction to that is hara, you see. So the Medrash is already indicating what will happen. Uh, and then it says, and this is the main part, that a bus call comes out, a divine voice. And the truth is, every day, a divine voice comes out, and only the extremely righteous can hear it, uh, this voice and so on, you know. It's really a proclamation of heaven in terms of their decrees. It says that, you know, do not worry, all that I have done, the fear from Persia and allowing Persia to go out, right? All that I have done to bring the redemption, you see? And Higiyaz man ulaschem, which is incredible. The time of your redemption has arrived, you see? <clears throat> so that means, interestingly enough, that this is the last war. What the Mershom seems to be doing, you see, is he's creating a circumstance where he wants to end the domination of Yishmoel, who are the Arabs. You see, he wants to end it because the messianic process cannot proceed unless he stops these people, the extreme militant Arabs and so on, from provoking and terrorizing the entire world and certainly Israel. 
Uh, so what the Barsham did, and I believe that's the essential idea, you see, of that, uh, this war, is he has so provoked, infuriated Israel, that Israel, and I'll talk about that, has finally come to the conclusion that these are not people, these are not humans, you see, you must utterly obliterate them. That's what you do to an en enemy of this nature. You know, wars are fought to win, not to sit and play ping pong with them and compromise. Well, we'll let you off the hook. You know, let's make peace for a couple of years. You see, and everybody knows that peace with who and so on. Uh, but in any case, this seems to be the, the, the uh, uh, purpose is to get the Jewish people, Israel, to destroy Hamas, and probably, very likely, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad in the Gaza, right? And ultimately, they must go after Iran. They must do that, you see. And that will be a major step in the Messianic process, because it will bring what? It will bring the end of Yishmoel, the evil of Yishmoel. But as we will see, Yishmoel does tshuva, repents. And that is the Abraham Accords with Saudi Arabia, which I will mention and so on, you see. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> one of the miracles of this war, by the way, you know, imagine if Iran had an atomic bomb. Would you be able to negotiate with them? Of course not. They have a whole different stance, position, right? This war would be a million times worse because you can't even stop Iran because they will threaten you with a nuclear weapon. And all you need is one bomb that will destroy Israel because how big is the whole state of Israel anyway? All you need to do is drop the bomb on Tel Aviv and the radiation will kill everybody in Israel and so on, you see. <clears throat> so therefore the miracle is that the Russian put into their heads, which is astounding. No, you gotta do it now. You know, you gotta do it now because we want you to symbolize this because it's exactly 50 years basically since the Kippur War. Yeah, but it doesn't make sense. Why don't you wait four weeks you get the bomb, and your bargaining position will be much greater. No, because the Russian performed the miracle of the Jew to the Jewish people that he made them do something which is contrary to logic. I mean, you're not five years away; you're only about four weeks away. That's what the that's what the politicians estimate. So wait, no, because the Russian put in their mind you need to conduct the war now before you have the bomb. Is, that, that, that's actually a tremendous miracle. <clears throat> very, very important, you see. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> we can ask ourselves, you know, why do they want to do it? They cannot dislodge Israel. They're not stupid people. You can't, what do they think? That they're gonna make a war with the Jews, Israel, right? And the government is just gonna leave? and say, okay, you take over. First of all, the goal of Hamas is to kill every Jew. They're not even really interested in the territory. They just want to get rid of the Jews, you see? So the question is, why are you conducting a war that you know is gonna destroy you? That makes no sense. So that itself is a mess. That they have no logic to any of this. This doesn't make any sense, you see? But that's what the Bershom did. He put into their mind to make this war. Like I said, at the time that there is no uh, atomic weapon to use, so their bargaining position is much worse. But I believe the reason why they did that, <clears throat> because what's about to happen is a game changer. Who is the authority, ultimately, and the legitimacy of the Arab claim against Israel? It's basically Saudi Arabia. Islam is really Saudi Arabia. They represent Islam. They have the uh, Kaaba, which is the place in, in Mecca where everybody goes for a pilgr pilgrimage. So there's a tremendous threat that they see that if Saudi Arabia actually makes peace with Israel, many Arab nations will follow. 
And therefore, their whole cause, their whole legitimacy to try to destroy Israel is gone. <coughs> and that to them is a very, very uh, worrisome idea. So in a certain sense, it makes sense why they tried it now. And besides, one of the ideas, which is a very important concept, is they see a tremendous amount of disunity in the Jewish people, which I'm going to talk about. <coughs> There's a tremendous amount of sinas chinam, hatred that is going on with the, with the Jewish people. So they see a tremendous amount of disunity, so they figure, who knows, the army has been threatening that they won't even join. So maybe. So therefore, why not do the war now? And so on. Anyway, all of these things gives them a certain logic. But the main idea is to do it now, before they acquire a nuclear weapon. You see, that's the main, that is really the miracle. Because the whole thing doesn't make sense. You know, <clears throat> and so on, you know. This mistake has been made by many people, where they act actually contrary, right, to their self-interest. For instance, Japanese. Why did they bomb Pearl Harbor? Are they idiots? For what purpose? In fact, the chief naval officer of Japan, Yamamoto, he said himself he disagreed with the whole plan to bomb Pearl Harbor. And he said, it's a famous statement, I only fear, right, that we have awakened a sleeping giant and filled him with a terrible resolve. He's right. So he said, how could you do that? What's the point of it? You know, let's consolidate our victories over the Pacific, and then maybe we'll do something like that. But why are we bringing America into the war? That's all it's going to do. And he was right. Because what did the Rabban Shem wanted? He wanted America to enter the war so they would defeat Nazi Germany. That was the whole point. So he put this foolish idea in the mind, and there were many other miracles uh, in Midway and so on, you know, where the Japanese didn't even realize what was going on and so on, you know, because he wants America to join the war to destroy the Nazis and, and so on, and therefore they, they made war in the United States. But it's completely contrary to the logic. You see, military logic. But listen, that's what the Mansham does. You see, <clears throat> another foolish person is Osama bin Laden. What are you doing? The United States will wipe you out. You can't stand up against the might of America's military. So what did he decide to do? 9-11? What kind of logic is that? Uh, you see, wait till you consolidate power. Then you could think about it. But don't provoke America. And of course, America went after him and ISIS and everybody, and they wiped them out. You see, again, it's con con because the Muslim wanted America to begin the war against the evil of Yishmael. So the same thing happens now. He gets Hamas, right? He gets Hamas to try to destroy right, Israel without a nuclear weapon, right? And for what, what's the point? You can't dislodge them anyway. All they'll do is destroy you. Finally, they woke up and they said, we must obliterate Hamas, you see. And what Israel has to do, which I'm hoping, of course, they will, is they are going to what's called raise Gaza. They're going to destroy it, and so on, you know. Now, <clears throat> what is important to understand, what the logic of the war is based on the divine plan, like I said, you know, is to end the domination of Yishmoel you see, and so on, you know. You have to realize what's going on. The Gemara says that the Mashiach comes, Kulm Chayovim, if all Jews are sinning, basically, or if all Jews are meritorious, Tzadikim. The problem is when the Mashiach comes because the Jews are sinning, and therefore the Jews are on what's called the Memtesh Shai Tumah. They're in the 49th level of Tumah, defilement and whatever, and sinning and so on, you know. The problem is, when the Bosham says, I'm going to bring the Mashiach, then the Sultan, right, Satan, tremendously makatreg, he tremendously prosecutes and says, wait a minute, you know, you're a God of justice. They don't deserve the Mashiach. They're sinning all over the place. Why should you bring the Mashiach? They don't deserve it. And you're a God of justice. This isn't just. This isn't Midas Adin. So the Bosham, in a certain sense, 
right, has a difficulty. Not literally, of course. God has no difficulties. But from our perspective, and I'm going to give a shia probably next week about what God does to get over the Midas Adin. But the main idea, okay, is this is a tremendous kitrig of the Sutton. Well, Rosh Hashanah, which unfortunately did not have shofar, you see, because the shofar protects us against the condemnation of what's about to happen to the Jews. There was no shofar because it was Shabbos. Now, without getting into all of that, that's very bad news, basically, for the Jewish people. So, what was defending the Jews on Rosh Hashanah? I believe that's one of the reasons why it happened. Because there was no shofar to remove the dinim, you see. And the sutton, in a certain sense, had free reign. And that's what he said. And the Bonsham said, you know, you're right in that sense, that they don't really deserve because there's so much incredible sinning of the Jewish people, right? And therefore, the decree was passed that the Jews have to satisfy justice because of all the sin chinam, the tremendous hatred that they have, and I will speak about that, and so on. So I have to satisfy justice, you see, because I have to deserve the Mashiach. So unfortunately and tragically, it was passed. And that happened immediately, right after Hoshana Rabbah, you see, <clears throat> and so on. Now, one of the ideas, which is in many ways very bad, you see, is the, the whole concept that Israel is going through a very difficult time. We don't realize it, and, and I believe that, that this is the main kitrug of the Sutton, you see. <clears throat> There's a tremendous war going on in Israel itself. It's really a civil war. It's not military, but it is a civil war. It's between the progressive left and the right. And it's over justice, you see. What Aram Barak did in the 90s is he usurped the power of the government to be completely under the hand of the judicial. Now, that is unheard of in any nation on earth. And everybody knows that, you see. So what he did is he destroyed democracy because the judicial branch can now annul and cancel any law that the Knesset passes. But wait a minute, the Knesset is the representative of the people of Israel, not the judicial body. So how do you do that? Well, without getting into it, they did it, Barak did it, and the Knesset allowed it to stand. I don't want to go into the whole history of that, which is a tremendous mistake. And now they want to, of course, change it and say, wait a minute, you know, you can't do this. You can't cancel laws by the Knesset. It's completely anti-democratic, you see. But here's the problem. Because who won the election? The right. Because the country, in many ways, is right. That's the overwhelming majority. And what they want, they don't want this, you see. They want the power to go back to the Knesset, which is a legitimate body, and the coalition and so on. So therefore, the last, it's called custard last stand. The last stand of the progressive left, which is basically the real heir of Rav, is the Supreme Court. Without that, they're nobodies. They're gone. They have absolutely no influence whatsoever. So really, it's not so much a war of democracy, it looks that way, but it's really a war against God because they don't want any influence, any kind of uh, pressure, whatever, that they think will happen, which it won't. From the Haredim, they think it's going to become a theocratic state, which of course is absurd. Of course it won't happen like that. So therefore, it is really a war against God. So that's the first idea, bad news for justice, you see for the Jewish people, in the eyes of justice, you see. The second thing, this has produced an enormous amount of sinas chinam, hatred of one Jew to the next. Next idea, not only that, but it has produced tremendous amount of lush and horror. You know how much lush and horror is spoken among the Jewish people concerning this conflict, and so on. But it's not only that, what is tragic is what is happening to Israel. There's an enormous amount of moral decay. 
All you have to do is go into Tel Aviv to take a look at what's happening. The moral decay, right? The degradation of what's happening. You know, there's 1.5 million kids in the school system, the secular school system in Israel, and there's hardly any Judaism taught. How is that possible? Did you ever look at the Chumash? How many times does Moshe Rabbeinu say, right? And you will observe the Chukim, the Mishpatim, the Mitzvahs. How many hundreds and hundreds of times? Could you imagine if he awoke today and he took a look that 1.5 million children know hardly anything about Judaism? You have any idea what kind of indictment that is against the Jews? So therefore, this is what's called to satisfy justice. This is what brings it on, you see. <clears throat> and what is interesting is not only does this war, unfortunately and tragically, satisfy justice, you see, and there are many people that, there are people going to say, well, why does justice have to be satisfied? What's wrong with the progressive left? So I'm not going to argue with them. Just take a look at the Torah and understand, well, what is Torah's comment on what you're doing? Right? What is that? And so on and so forth. But what the Moshim has also done, which is very interesting, and only he could do that, he has destroyed the icons of Israel. Uh, you don't realize there's going to be a significant change to Israel after this. First of all, he's destroyed the credibility of the Mossad. I mean, he's one of the greatest military intelligence failures in history just by looking at how many people have died in such a brutal way. How can the Mossad, how can you have a thousand terrorists go to the border and nobody stops them? I mean, what happened to the Mossad? So that destroys the credibility, you see, the icons of the Mossad, you see. And not only that, when people see the brutality of what Hamas is doing, they all of a sudden realize something. I, well, I don't stand. If you want to negotiate with somebody who has a claim, so you negotiate. But you cannot negotiate with a guerrilla. What are you going to do that? You're looking at Hamas, right? They are vowed to kill Jews, all of them, right? So what are you negotiating? All you're doing is kicking the can down the road. Ultimately, of course, they're going to come after you and try to kill you. So it, 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 in the logic of it is beyond belief. Uh, such an enemy must be destroyed. You can't negotiate with these people. Just like I said, can you negotiate with a gorilla, right? Not to destroy you and so on? Of course not. You have to take action. So how can the Israeli government do this? Negotiate, right? And it includes, of course, Netanyahu. How can they negotiate with people that say they want to kill you? Imagine somebody moves across the street from you. Right? And he calls you up and says, you know, I'm going to kill you and your entire family. And then all of a sudden you take a look at the window across the street and you see the guy is in his living room, right? And he's got machine guns pointed at you, right? So what are you going to do? You're going to negotiate with the guy? Uh, you see, of course not. you got to take him out in some way. It's the same idea. How could Israel have made such a terrible mistake? I understand that there are factors. Maybe you're afraid that you're going to have to support Gaza if you take out Hamas, or whatever. Uh, but basically, Jews died. You think anybody cares in terms of the fact they're dead, brutally. You know, that you had Hezbollahs, you had reasons for not taking them out. Not only that, how can... <clears throat> You can't negotiate with a monster, and people now see that we're talking about a monster, you see. So that's a major flaw in the present ruling class, and I believe it's going to come back to haunt them, you see. Uh, the second thing which is I find to be absolutely incredible is it's very difficult to get a license to get a gun. You know, in America, I have a Second Amendment, that you have a right to bear arms. Why? That's a fundamental right to defend yourself. A government cannot take away the right of a person to defend itself. Of course not. But in Israel, they're surrounded by enemies outside of Israel and within Israel. How many times people die because some guy's walking around, right, and he kills people. Israelis are sitting ducks. So how could you deny them weapons to defend themselves. 
it's very likely that had Israelis had weapons, guns, you wouldn't have had such a slaughter because at least they would have weapons to defend themselves. So what logic is it that they have denied people weapons to defend themselves when they are surrounded within and without by enemies that are vowed to kill them? I believe that all of this will create a significant uh, change in the government. And if you think about that, you know, I mean, we're not talking here about a, f a policy flaw. No, we're talking about a policy that has killed over, what, 1,200 Jews already? Not just now. Where do you, where, where, we just watch what happens when Israel has to go into Gaza, right? And they, all of a sudden, the uh, Hamas is going to put up the hostages, right? And they all booby-trapped the whole place and so on. For what? They should have taken them out when they had the chance. It's really terrible, you see. So what the Ranshma has done is he has actually taken advantage of this major policy flaw of Israel, you see. And like I say, he has destroyed the credibility of the Mossad. Because no matter what the reason is, I mean, you know, it's inexcusable of how these guys walk into Israel, a thousand of them, in many, many, 80 different places and so on, and just had free reign on killing Jews. It's just beyond belief and so on, you know. <clears throat> in any case, so I believe really what happened is the Rabbi Shem took away the free will of Hamas. He wants them to war with Israel so that they will take out Hamas. This is the process of the Messianic era. You need to get rid of the garbage first, you see. And then you could begin introducing Torah, right? Mitzvahs and so on, changing the world like it says, what the Rav Shem says in Itzavim, you know, even if you're outcasts, he's talking about the Jews, be at the ends of heaven. From there, means at the ends of heaven, I will gather you, right? I will take you to me, right? And I will bring you to Israel, right? Uh, that's the positive. But before you get into the positive, you need to remove the negative. And that is basically what is happening. There's also something else. You have to realize something. The Holocaust never ended. People are very short-sighted. You don't realize that. The Holocaust never ended. <clears throat> what is the essential nature of the Holocaust? Kill Jews. That's what Hitler's essential mission was, to kill the Jews. And he writes that in Mein Kampf in 1923. That's what a Holocaust, except the Holocaust is a battle, right, that is horrendous. It involves millions of people. So we call it a Holocaust. But the objective or the goal of the Holocaust is to kill the Jews, right? There's two ways to kill the Jews, you see. One is to kill them, which is exactly what Nazi Germany did, right? But there's a, se a second way of killing the Jews. And that is every time Israel goes to war with its enemy, right? You come out and say, well, you can't do this. This is disproportionate. You know, you've already killed more than you should, right? You have to allow your enemy to survive, right? And to maintain themselves. So restraint, when a government like the United States tell Israel to restrain themselves, that's the strategy of a Holocaust. It's a second form of Holocaust, you see? Because what they're doing is keeping the enemy alive for the next time. You see, so when Israel finally gets its act together and begins destroying Hamas, what's going to happen? In four or five days, when they're busy destroying Hamas, guess what? People are going to begin saying, right, wait a minute, you can't do this. It's disproportionate, right? And if it's disproportionate, this is not right. What do you mean not right? They just beheaded 40 infants. What's called proportion, right? But they're going to tell Israel to stop. That is a Holocaust strategy that the world is still interested in. You see, <clears throat> that's what's going to happen. Now, I feel sorry for the nations of the world. Why? Because you're looking at one of the ways that God is determining who is on my side 
and who is against me. This is called a bureau event. It is an event to clarify, you see, who is on the side of righteousness, who is on the side of human decency, right, and what makes sense, and who is on the side of butchery and slaughter, you see, which is exactly what Hamas is doing. This is a bureau event, and the Goyim, the non-Jews, or any of the liberals, they don't understand they're being tested. And I want to tell you something. Do you know what the most frightening thing will be in the history of mankind? I will tell you, and people don't realize that, you see. It's not wars that men make against men and slaughter them and the butchery, right, and the savagery and so on. It is the retribution of God, right? That's the most frightening thing of all because God knows exactly what you did, how many times you did it, and how many victims of what you did. Not only that, he can't be bought off. There's no bribery you can offer him. So he will execute, when the judgment time arrives, he's going to execute judgment and justice, right? And you have no idea what that means, and I mentioned that a, a couple of weeks ago. He's going to slaughter you. More than that, he's going to take your blood and splatter it all over the place. That's frightening, you see? And, and he will do it in the name of justice, right? Not in the name where what Hamas is doing to kill Jews and so on. No, this is Midas Adin. This is what you deserve. And before God does that to you, he's got to show you a movie of your life committing all this evil, you see? And God is going to say, okay, this is what you did, and this is what you must undo. You will be destroyed. Utterly and immediately. That's what... And people don't realize that. They're not afraid of the retribution of God. They have no idea of the infinite power of God and what He's going to do to the nations of the world, not only for the Holocaust and the anti-Semitism that apparently is spreading all over the United States, especially in the colleges and universities. They have no idea what God is going to do to them. You see, like I said, it's a bureau event. It is a clarification of event where you need to choose which side are you on. And that is what's going to happen. So if anybody dares tell Israel, after right now the statistic is 1,200 Jews have been butchered. 1,200 people. Could you imagine that? And we're not even talking about how they have been butchered and so on, you know. And I think they're saying now that uh, I think 5,000 people are now in the hospital. So the first victims are who? The people who have been killed mercilessly and without any kind of humanity. The second group of victims is the people who are in the ICU, right? In the hospitals. But remember one thing. It's not just them. Their whole family is finished. This is going to leave an indelible mark on this family for the rest of their lives. So you've destroyed the family, which is far more than just 5,000 people. You're looking at 20, 25,000 people. These are the victims, you see, and you on a side with Hamas, you see, <clears throat> you know, I'd be very, very careful on which side you choose, because you are now being offered an unbelievable choice. Who are you going to join, you see? And th there's no excuse. Well, Israel is the oppressor. What oppressor? Do you know the history of the Middle East? Do you have any idea what it says in the Torah that God gives the Jewish people Israel? Do you have any idea what, what was happening, you know, not only with Britain, but the San Remo Conference, or that the League of Nations said that Israel has a right, that legally they have the right to Israel, and they've been in Israel, right, uh, for 2,000 years? The Arabs mostly come from Syria, People don't even know the history of the region, right? So there is no such thing as Palestine. I mean, this is an old understanding, you know. There's no such thing as Palestine. There was no such country as Palestine. So when the Jews have taken over Israel, it's Israel. It's not Palestine. 
The Arabs don't come from Palestine, basically. They come from Syria or other parts of the Middle East. And they were encouraged to settle in Israel. I mean, I'm just mentioning some of the brief history because of the British. Because the British didn't want to, you know, anger the Arabs because they had oil then. So they allowed the Jews, they, I should say, they allowed the Arabs to come in. They created, the Britain created a problem. Why do you think God demoted them? They used to be the, really the greatest nation on earth you know, in 1800 and so on, right? And now they're nobodies, basically nobodies. They've been demoted, they have been not only demoted, uh, the whole country doesn't really function, and so on, you see. Uh, but this is all a punishment for what they've done. So just wait to see what the world is going to do. But if they tell Israel to restrain themselves, it's another Holocaust. That's basically what it is. You see, <clears throat> you know, I find it astonishing. Think about this. You have an entire world. The UN, I think, has 193 nations. Okay. There are really more. There are many that are not part of the, the UN, right? Who is responsible for all the terror in the world? Think about that. It's basically what? Iran. The three enemies of mankind, basically, is Iran, most of the terror, certainly in the Middle East, comes from Iran, right? How much suffering and death have they brought about, number one? Then there's Russia under Putin. Then there's Communist China under Xi Jinping. Those are the three enemies of mankind. They are responsible for an untold amount of suffering, human suffering, you know? So even if we leave out Russia and Communist China, why doesn't the world deal with Iran? Why did they allow Iran to create such misery and suffering and death and torture? Why? All it is is a nation. And not only that, you don't have to destroy Iran. You destroy their infrastructure. You send them back to the Stone Age. Or what you do is you destroy the mullahs. And the Iranians anyway want to get rid of them. So the question is astonishing. Why do they allow Iran to put everybody through this terrible, terrible uh, history. It's incredible how the world tolerates. And the answer to that is because there are many evil empires that are part of the decision-making process, uh, you see, and they stop the world from exercising justice. You have any idea what God is going to do to these nations or to the people responsible? for creating enormous amount of suffering. I want to tell you one thing. The justice of God is precise down to the nanometer, right? Uh, so you don't realize if you cause a person suffering, God knows and he's going to collect for that suffering. If you contribute it in any way, no matter how far away you are from the causal chain, the chain of events that ultimately did the suffering, you are included in the retribution process. You don't realize how exact is the justice of God, you see. So we think about that, and you can't believe how many people will, be, will, will, will suffer for the, the terrible injustice that they have done, you see. <clears throat> I, you know, I heard a statement that the UN Secretary General he said that he was very disturbed that Israel is now going to go and take over Gaza. Excuse me. If they did this to your wife, would you also be disturbed? Or would you seek justice and vengeance? Uh, what is this guy talking about? And he's a Secretary General, Guterres, of the UN. Is this man normal? Of course not. They're all part of the anti-Semites, even though they say they're not. But they're all part of the chorus that sings for the death of the Jewish people, you see. <clears throat> and not only that, we have no idea when retribution finally takes place, you know? I mean, they are giving money. They are promoting Iran. Instead of taking out Iran and recognizing, right, uh, that they are one of the most vicious killers of mankind, and they're only one nation, so take them out. No. Instead, Biden, what does he do? He gives them $6 billion, even if it's their money. It's irrelevant, because we all know what they're going to do with the money, right? Not only that, Obama gave them what? $400 billion in cash. How do you do that? How are you going to look at God in the face, 
right? When God says to you, how could you support people that want to maim, torture, kill people? For what? Because they really believe that their religion is supreme? What is that, a heter of some sort? What is that? Is that a, does that make the act permissible? How do you do that? What's he going to answer? He won't. And we don't even want to contemplate what God is going to do to him and even Obama. doesn't make a difference because they have aided and abetted the murder of innocent people over and over again. <clears throat> and I'm not even talking about that, you see. How does Biden allow fentanyl to come in over the border? He took an oath of office, right, to protect America, the American citizens. So how do you allow fentanyl with a cartel to come in over the border? <clears throat> that means you are responsible for every death. And there were last year, there was about 140,000 American citizens that died because of the fentanyl which Biden is responsible because he's opened the borders. Does he have any idea what God is going to do to him when judgment finally comes? And like I say, it's not only him. It's all those anti-Semites, you see, what's going to happen to them as a result of promoting, right, these ideas and so on, you see. Uh, like I said, you know, somebody once said, you know, somebody once said, you know, uh, Lewis, who's a famous Middle Eastern expert and so on, that we're not looking at war of nations, really. We're looking at a war of civilization, and he's right in that sense. But he's really wrong. We're not looking at a war of civilization. We're looking at a war between good and evil. That's the ultimate war. Who is on the side of good, on the side of holiness, on the side of righteousness? And that's really what God wants. And who's on the side of what? Of evil, torture, brutality, savagery, and so on. And in the end, it's going to be beyond belief what God does when God says it's now time to exact retribution for what you people have done, and so on, you see. <clears throat> Look, this is the idea. This war, as bad as it is, which is terrible, and so on, has many aims, objectives to it. It's not just, like I said, you know, everything that God does is only to do what? To advance the process of the Messianic era. And like I brought down the Medrash, the last war basically, which is really incredible, is the war of Persia. And it says that, that a divine voice comes out and says that Higiyaz man yulaschem, the time of your redemption has arrived, you see. So what we're looking forward to, obviously, is a real turnaround. Israel has to do what it does. They must protect themselves, they must defend themselves, and they have to obliterate Hamas. But it's not only that. They really have to obliterate Nasrallah, you see, and his, uh, the Hezbollah. They have over a hundred thousand missiles pointed. The question is, how can Israel allow that? How do you allow a guy to point missiles at you, swearing ultimately one day to use it, and rely on their fear of you? How do you do that? Where's your sense of proportion? And so on, you see. But that's part of the failure of this government to protect the citizens of, of Israel and so on, you see. Uh, so what's probably going to happen is major changes, especially after this, you know, uh, this war and so on and so forth. And ultimately, hopefully, what that will do is remove the major, one of the major impediments to the growth of the state of Israel. Because the Russian wants to bring back everybody to Israel. Ultimately, they can't come back to Israel now. You know, it takes 12 years to get a license to build anything in Israel. You have any idea what the regulations and the bureaucracy is of Israel? Why it's so difficult to get anything done? And so on, you see. Forget about the cost of living. I'm afraid even to talk about that. And so on. <clears throat> but who's responsible for that? Who's responsible for 1.5 million kids not knowing anything of Judaism? 
who's responsible for that? You, you see, so it's not only the religion that they're trying to destroy or neutralize or whatever, but it's the ability to live there. So therefore all of this will take time. And what's interesting is whatever takes time needs a lot of time for preparation. And it's very possible that this year, Tovshin Pei Dalad, right, 5,784, is the year that the Rebbe has finally said, enough is enough. I need to really prepare the entry of the Mashiach, the beginning of true righteousness, spirituality, holiness, and correct behavior and so on. I need to begin now because it's going to take a, quite a while for everything to happen. But you can't do anything unless you clean up the garbage. It's always like that, you know. You can't decorate a house that you moved into unless you throw out the old furniture from the previous tenant, obviously. Uh, so that has to be the first uh, stage, the cleanup and so on. We are looking at the cleanup as far as I'm concerned, and so on. And that's the Messianic. But unfortunately, like I said, because the Bershom is bringing the Mashiach, even though everybody, there's so much sinning uh, going on, and hatred, and, and, and so on, and the war against God, and so on, you see, then the Bershom has to satisfy justice, because he is a God of justice. And we are looking at that. And this was a tragedy. I believe a, a lot of it occurred because there was no shofar on Shabbos which would protect the Jews and seeing. But the fact that all of this, as I said, happened immediately. I mean, you talk about the day after Hishana Rabbah, that's when it started. Means that the Rebbe is not waiting. He doesn't want to wait. He wants it to end now. And that's what he seems to be doing, you see. So in any case, it's like I say, something to think about. <clears throat> that even though it's terrible what's happening now, but in the end, all of it will come home to actually, you know, uh, promote the whole messianic process and bring real spirituality, righteousness, and everything to the Jewish people and also the whole world, because God will remove all the evil once and for all. Thank you.